production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm John Mitterholzer, Senior Program Officer for the Environment at the George Gunn Foundation and a proud City Club member. It is my pleasure to introduce you to, to today's forum, the first in our Igniting the Future series, exploring, the, exploring how the Cuyahoga River fire and its aftermath set the stage for the modern environmental movement. Today's speaker is Dennis Hayes. At just 25 years old, Mr. Hayes, then a student at Harvard, was recruited by Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson to organize a national teach-in on the environment following some of the environmental disasters of 1969, the Santa Barbara oil spill and the Cuyahoga River fire. The event, held on April 22, 1970, was known as the first Earth Day, celebrated by 20 million Americans. In the ensuing decades, Earth Day has grown from a grassroots effort into the largest secular observance in the world, celebrated in 192 countries, moving environmentalism from a fringe issue to a mainstream concern. Over the years, Mr. Hayes has been a special assistant to the governor of Illinois for natural resources and the environment, a senior fellow at the World Watch Institute, an adjunct professor at Stanford University, regents professor at the University of California, and a Silicon Valley attorney. Since 1993, Mr. Hayes has served as the president and CEO of the Bullet Foundation of Seattle, which funds environmental protection and restoration projects in the northwestern part of the United States. Under his leadership, the foundation designed and constructed the Bullet Center, the world's greenest office building, which it operates as a commercial enterprise. Joining Mr. Hayes on stage is IdeaStream's senior host and producer, Rick Jackson. Mr. Jackson is an award-winning journalist with more than 35 years of experience as a television and radio anchor and reporter. He's been on the air in all 50 states and in 40 foreign countries, and is currently the host of Ideas and News Depth for WBIZ PBS. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Dennis Hayes and Rick Jackson. <laughs> Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Folks, I was looking back over some of the stories we've done on the TV show in the last year or so. It's kind of interesting. I spotted one on the first ever local stand-up paddleboard race. We had another on area rowers practicing for the head of the Charles Regatta. If you know anything at all about rowing, that's the biggie up in Boston. There was another discussion about considering removal of the Brexville Dam. Now, you know the link here. None of these things could have happened or would have happened on a river that looked or smelled the way the Cuyahoga did back in 1969. The fire, the subsequent creation of Earth Day, the renewed interest in our outdoor reputation, it all came with the change in how we, here in Northeast Ohio, treat the environment. Dennis and his era of forward thinkers get a lot of the credit for that as well. We welcome you for that. But as he and I talked a week or so ago, he told me something interesting. He said, in the 50 years since the burning of the Cuyahoga became the emblem of all that was wrong with industrial America, We've done a lot, but we need to do a lot more. So let me welcome you and start there. How could we possibly need to do more than what we've done? <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me first say how much we've done. Well, let me first say thank you very much for welcoming him back to Cleveland. I've, I've always jumped at every chance to come to Cleveland, which is maybe the friendliest big city in the United States. Uh, <laughs> I will say I have not been to Cleveland in January before. <laughs> Wait till uh, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, what we have done since then is, is kind of staggering. In the immediate aftermath of Earth Day, the next few years, uh, we established an environmental protection agency, passed a Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, an Endangered Species Act, a Marine Mammal Protection Act, a Forest Protection Act, Superfund, FIFRA. 
uh, RICRA, uh, a wave of legislation that, according to a government study that was done a few years ago, when you look at all of the costs of all of that to the taxpayers and to the private sector, and then compare that with the benefits, the net benefits over the last five decades have amounted to $23 trillion. I mean, it's difficult today as you look around any American city to remember that 50 years ago, Cleveland, Gary, Pittsburgh, Los Angeles, looked like Shenzhen, Beijing, New Delhi, Mexico City today. I mean, we've, we've just made enormous progress. Having said that, um, we are now facing a series of new threats that in many ways are, are more formidable. Uh, and they, they are legion, and there's been allusions to various of them in the introductory comments here. Climate change, where there are irreversible tipping points. I mean, it, it's a difficult thing for people to get their hands around that you can't change back something. But you can draw down carbon from the atmosphere. We have no way that anyone has thought of to deacidify the world's oceans. Um, we have now basically an epidemic of extinction is racing around the planet. E.O. Wilson in his new book, Half Earth, says that it is almost certainly the strongest, fastest wave of extinction that the planet has ever experienced. Um, problems that some people have thought of as sort of aggravations, but now have achieved to such incredible scale that they're really important. They, the filling of the world's oceans with plastics. You know, you, you, you can do these calculations and they are misleading. If you keep going the way that you're going right now for the next 30 years, something like that, okay. But on that one, if we do continue for the next 30 years the way we've gone for the next last 20 years, the weight of plastic in the world's ocean will be greater than the weight of fish and marine mammals in the world's oceans. So when, when you see something like that that simply can't happen, you know that it's got to stop. But to cause things to stop internationally is vastly more difficult than to change things in Cleveland or Ohio or the United States. These global commons and these international issues where we absolutely depend upon the cooperation of other countries and they depend upon our cooperation are tough. And hopefully that's, um, that's what we're going to be achieving over the course of the next 10 years. We're going to be talking past, present, and future during this conversation, not necessarily in that order, but let's go ahead and start with past, because Dennis told me that for all the acclaim Cleveland got for sparking the EPA and the Clean Water Act in 72, um, Mayor Stokes kind of waxed and waned. He led the charge, but then he didn't put it in his autobiography. You kind of have to wonder where the thought process was. Where was Cleveland City Hall? Was there a disconnect to the importance of the environmental movement, or were they firmly on board? Well, I, I, I'm not sure if it's a secret to anybody in this room. Um, it, it, it would shock most people in the United States. Uh, the fire on the Cuyahoga was not much in 1969. It lasted half an hour. It did about $100,000 worth of damage. The mayor did hold a press conference, a walking press conference, where he talked about it with, with the media. Um, but what really made it was Time Magazine's coverage, which was very prominent and used a, a photograph from a much bigger 1952 fire. You had fires on the Cuyahoga and on every industrial river repeatedly. I mean, the, the first one that I'm familiar with that was that received press attention on the Cuyahoga was shortly after the Civil War. <laughs> but, but in 1969, there was a ripeness and a receptivity coupled with the fact that water isn't supposed to burn you got to <laughs> fire someplace. You go to the river with your fire boat. And, um, and, and, and so that juxtaposition just gave it a, a, a huge emblematic thing. With regard to, to Mayor Stokes and, and, and also to his close colleague, he was the first African-American mayor of a major American city. Gary, Indiana, likes to think of itself as a major American city. Uh, Richard Hatcher was elected at the same election, but, but, but Stokes got the visibility, and both of them were early champions of what we would now call environmental justice, of talking about the disproportional impact of environmental issues just like everything else, education, health care, um, diets, uh, it's just crime, drugs. It, it, the, the disproportionate impact on the poor and upon people of color is, is something that he, he spoke of very eloquently. Um, but when he was looking back upon his years uh, in the uh, mayor's office, he did not think that the fire on the Cuyahoga River was 
sufficiently important to warrant even a paragraph in it. I think it's like a 270-page autobiography. Uh, but for the rest of the country, as somebody said, uh, you're welcome, United States. Uh, we, we're, we, we got an enormous boost from the coverage of that fire. He did talk to his brother, though, and not all of us have the advantage of a brother in Congress. He did <laughs> manage true. to help push some federal legislation. Yeah, no. And, and if, if you say uh, thank you to America, let America say thank you to Cleveland for the Stokes brothers. They both played an enormously valuable role. With the Stokes leading the way, should Cleveland take credit? Should we be waving our own flag a lot more across the country for saying, look what we did for you? <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure I'd be too proud of a river that caught on fire. <laughs> uh, um, but but I, I think that there is something that uh, I'd, I'd flip that around into the part of the discussion where we're talking today and tomorrow. I mean, Cleveland, they're, they're, yeah, heavens, we're all being honest here today. Much of America has been hollowed out by changes that have occurred in the industrial nature of the United States, the offshoring of jobs, the offshoring of much of the industrial base that was in here and in Detroit and in so much of the American Midwest. Uh, and we're going to come out of that. We're kind of got with a, a new kind of economy that is uh, broadly distributed in terms of the jobs that it provides and the, the, the wealth that it will generate. And that can be done in a way that is truly sustainable. And it can be done in a way that could be catastrophic. And hopefully Cleveland will be providing that model. Uh, I, I, I don't want to put too much baggage on Earth Day. I'm, I'm really delighted with, with what Great Lakes Brewery is doing. And we've got a, a great many triple bottom line enterprises around the world that are jumping into it, as well as activist groups. Um, but the concept of an intense period of environmental focus, I, I'm referring to it as Earth Spring, rather than the, of which Earth Day will be a component. If we can create in Cleveland uh, a cultural transformation, a, a way that people perceive the opportunities in this city differently as a consequence of things that the people in this room, which is an enormously diverse audience, come together to envision your future. I think you could be doing uh, an enormous service for this entire region of the country by mapping out where you can go, what the future can look like. I, candidly, that's what we are trying to do in Seattle for a different kind of economy and a different set of cities around the world. We, we're, Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver, British Columbia are basically the turf of my foundation, and we spend our money trying to build them as models of urban sustainability at a time when recently we passed the milestone where 50% of all people live in cities en route to something by 2050 where north of 80% of all people will live in cities. We've become an urban species, and yet most of our cities are not particularly attractive places to live, and they should be. Mm -hmm. I do want to get back to the work the Bullock Foundation's been doing and leading the way on, but you mentioned early on, 20 years down the line, 30 years down the line, just in October, the United Nations released a landmark report talking about this grim future, they called it, for our planet if we don't aggressively and rapidly reverse course. Have we gone too far down the road? Can we still reverse course and get back to a much more livable place? <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, and th th there are things that um, are enormous opportunities for us. Uh, uh, the, the transition that is now being spoken of, in, in, in this highly politicized era, it's now identified entirely with progressives, but there's no reason that a new Green Deal should necessarily be a progressive thing as opposed to something that makes sense for everybody, where you come up with something that moves as swiftly as possible to 100% reliance upon the very efficient use of renewable energy resources. Just enormous, spectacular growth opportunities for different solar technologies, for wind technologies, for different kinds of storage technologies, batteries, hydrogen, for new kinds of vehicles. I mean, it, it will be a rebirth of all kinds of things that resemble stuff that was done in Cleveland historically. It's just the next generation of these things. Um, having said that, we have passed some tilting points. There will be more hurricanes and they will be more intense in the future than they have been in the past. There are things that you can do to draw down the carbon in the atmosphere and slowly you can begin to reverse some of that stuff. But we're, we're not talking about things that will affect dramatically the environment of my daughter. We're talking now about trying to get back to something approaching normalcy during the lifetime of my granddaughter. Um, 
and then and that's sad. And there are some of them, you know, for for fifty years, one of the little bumper strips is extinction is forever. Uh, as as you pass one of those things and a species no longer exists, then that's simply gone. And that unique little slot of the ecosystem that whether it's predator or prey or what its role is in the vast web of life, that bolt is taken out of, the, out of the fabric. And as I mentioned earlier, the one that really troubles me a lot is that when people have come up with geoengineering solutions to climate change, they say, let's continue to throw carbon into the atmosphere, but, but we can keep the earth cool by putting particulates into the stratosphere to reflect sunlight or put little aluminum disks into the stratosphere. To, or, or we can be having massive tree planting campaigns to pull carbon down into the atmosphere. Well, and the tree planting actually makes sense for a great many reasons, but that doesn't do anything for the oceans. I mean, once you've acidified the oceans, we don't have, a, at the moment, a plausible way to deacidify them. So that becomes a tilting point as you begin to lose coral reefs, the, the, the rainforests of the sea, and so forth. You were talking about the diversity of the audience here at the City Club. We look out, we see Great Lakes Brewery, Bank of America, the sewer district is here. There's a lot of groups out there that are leading the charge, but for regular folks, how do we keep the spark? How do we feel like, well, they're doing a lot, I can do a little, but we all need to do more? Hmm. Well, there's a, a, a couple of things. One is, uh, in, in building a movement, and this is something uh, that has been recognized by every religion now for millennia, uh, people will be more deeply committed to something if they are making actions on behalf of it, whether it is recycling your beverage containers, whether it's planting trees, whether it's going down and cleaning up a beach or a riverfront that is messed up. They, these, these things are not going to reverse climate change, but it builds a sense of community and commitment to a set of values. Uh, the other thing that is really important in terms of mobilizing individuals, though, to around these issues is that um, it will not, the, the big ones are not going to be solved entirely by voluntary actions. When I went through that list of triumphs after the first Earth Day, these were all federal legislation and the regulations that were issued pursuant to that and the successful lawsuits that were brought after that. I mean, a great many CEOs wanted to do something that was really much more sustainable than they were doing before, but if their competitors didn't do it, then they would be priced out of the market. You had to raise the bar for everyone. And, and uh, in the future, this is going to be as true or more true than in the past. What the, the role of every individual is to master the issues and vote. I mean, the, the, the democracy theme has been running through this entire gathering, and I get a sense that the City Club, the intelligent civic discourse, and democratic values is absolutely at the core of what it's about. Well, that's at the core of environmental change as well. Uh, I, you can build a decent case that, uh, that the real Earth Day is Election Day. Let's stay on that thought then. We have an administration right now that has actively not actively addressed climate change, uh, tried to pull the United States from the Paris Accords in 2017. Is there a large split between public leadership, or public desire, and our leadership right now in which direction we should be going? Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, uh, to, to elaborate just a little bit more. Uh, there, there's, there's confusion about the Paris Accords. It turns out that under the terms of the Accords, withdrawal has a formalized process that is associated with it. And ironically, given when President Trump made the announcement that he wished to withdraw, the earliest time that we can formally complete that process is one week after the next presidential election. So every now and then you start to believe there really is a God. <laughs> um, and any, any new president can reverse that process on 10 days notice. So that's not all lost. And President Trump and, and Scott Pruitt and his successor and Ryan Zinke and his successor are now trying to basically take the teeth out of 67 important federal environmental regulations. But those things are also appealable in court. Those things, once again, if we have support in ideally both houses of Congress, you, you can throw up 
to coin a phrase, you can throw up a wall around them to, to <laughs> safeguard them. Uh, and and I, 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 I'm, let, let me say a slightly different thing. If, if you're talking about climate, polls suggest that about 70, depending on how you phrase the question, 70 to 75 percent of Americans now believe that climate change is real and that it has a human signature. Um, that's a pretty awesome number. If you look at the last election, uh, something on the order of 22, 23 percent of people thought that climate change was an important issue. And of those, 2 percent thought that it was the most important issue. So you, you have something where, I mean, I, I, I care about gun control. The environment doesn't evoke the same passions as are on both sides of the gun control issue, uh, the same passions that are on both sides of the abortion issue, the same passions that are, I mean, somehow passion has to be part of this. And we have developed over the last 50 years an extraordinary degree of scientific expertise. The International Panel on Climate Change is just a wonderful international gathering of people who've devoted very successful professional careers to this. But it doesn't elicit that same kind of passion, and passion matters in politics. Um, so if, if you're talking about the difference between Trump and the public, yeah, they disagree with the president, but the people who feel most passionately about this, um, in the sense that if you're wrong on this, I will not vote for you, is coal miners uh, and coal company shareholders. I mean, they're, they're, that's where they basically see what they perceive as their future livelihood at stake, and they will make it a single-issue ticket. I, I don't like single-issue politics. I think that we ought to be having a broad agenda and we ought to be voting for this, but climate has now reached the stage where, I guess, for me, and I think for, I hope for in the next election, much more than 2% of the people, if you are wrong on climate, you cannot be elected president of the United States. The planet just can't tolerate that. Please. When you look out at this near sellout crowd at the City Club and the untold thousands who are listening to you on the radio, do you feel like activism is almost to the passion point or are we still considerably lacking? Uh, I, I think we're like a super saturated solution. I mean, we've, we've, we've got these 70% figures that are out there. We've got something where there's an awareness that is growing it is, I think, a little bit, uh, huge differences, but a little bit like the situation in late 1969, where there was this really deep sense of unease that something was profoundly wrong with the direction that America was heading. Uh, we were getting richer every year, but the quality of our life was deteriorating every year. And, and we've been fighting for a decade for civil rights advances, and we'd passed some federal legislation, and a huge section of the country had just come back with a massive backlash. And, and people had been protesting a war in Southeast Asia with more and more and more people taking more and more extraordinary efforts to, to try to end it and actually throw Lyndon Johnson out of office only to get Richard Nixon in who expands it with an invasion of Cambodia. I mean, the, the, the frustration was just their pent up. And by linking that into some of our issues, the fact that all of this was pent up on a variety of issues, by, by talking about the war in Vietnam, in part by focusing upon stillborn births uh, as a result of the use of chemical defoliants, the replacement of fertile mangroves, which were teeming with life and things that people were fishing in, the sterile bamboo forests, by Tying that into environmental issues, we could bring that entire camp in. There wasn't a serious environmental leader in the country, a serious anti-war leader that didn't give an Earth Day speech. Uh, in the civil rights arena, we were talking about environmental justice. It was lead paint, lead in gasoline, probably the most important passionate one, stopping freeways from cutting through vibrant inner cities and, and basically destroying the fabric of the communities that were there. And, and I can't say that most of the civil rights leaders, but a huge fraction of the civil rights leaders of America were out there on Earth Day tying those issues together. And one of the great losses, one of my dearest friends from back there was a guy named George Wiley who 
ran the National Welfare Rights Organization. He died in a boating accident, too young. Um, but remarkably articulate and charismatic and capable of bringing along the African-American community any time that he spoke. And most people didn't know he had a PhD in organic chemistry from, from Cornell. And he was really into environmental justice issues and the poisoning of our communities. All of that stuff pulls it together with that activist base and it, it got us launched in a fashion that I think now we have a similar sort of situation on a wide variety of issues if we can just make the tent big enough that everybody feels comfortable being part of it. Okay. I wanted to leave some time to talk about, before we go to Q&A, talk about the Bullet Foundation and this living building of yours that we had talked about earlier on. I don't know if a lot of you have heard about the Bullet Foundation and this incredibly green building. Uh, Google, Bing, Yahoo, whatever. I'm not going to endorse your search engine, but find out something about it. It's an incredible... Duck, duck, go. There you go. I like that one too. It's a federal, it's a federal, it's a fantastic building that essentially is its own environment. Mm -hmm. Where did it come from? How did you create it? And why don't we have one here? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, hopefully uh, your museum will be coming up with a super green building here uh, too. They're exploring what the options are. You, you wouldn't want to have the Bullet Center in Cleveland. You just have a terribly different environment. As, as we said the last time we were talking, 80 years ago, you take a photograph of a building in Atlanta a building in Phoenix and a building in Anchorage, and you say, which is where? And you know, we had regional architecture. We designed it to deal with the microclimate that it was in. Today, we build the same thing everywhere and use cheap electricity to dehumidify Atlanta, to cool uh, Phoenix, and to heat up Anchorage. That's just stupid. <laughs> and, and what we did with the Bullet Center was to design it for the Pacific Slope rainforest. So it, uh, to, to go through the attributes, uh, and I should say with all of this, we. What people think of as sexy is the supply side. What's really important is the demand side. Um, we, we use dramatically less electricity, despite the fact that most of our tenants are high technology companies, because we were able to <laughs> persuade them that uh, they should choose the most efficient equipment that meets their needs. I mean, we, we had one engineering firm that came in, and it, it was actually involved in setting the energy goals for the building. They took a look at their energy consumption in their previous location and they were using five times as much electricity per employee as they could to meet the cap here. So they went through and took a look at how they were using electricity and what, what was the equipment that was there. And they discovered, to no great surprise, that their employees were engineers. <laughs> I mean, everybody wanted to have the most powerful computer that he could possibly get. And, and, and it was, for the most part, they were, they were doing things like spreadsheets, they were doing some diagrams, they were writing email, they were searching the web. Uh, you know, every now and then they had a modeling operation that really required some horsepower, but they found they could do all of that with a bunch of dumb terminals and one server. So they reduced their energy consumption by 80% when they moved in, with absolutely no loss in productivity but just making smart choices. In any case, this is a building that's, that, that produces now about 10% more electricity each year from solar panels on its roof than a six-story structure uses. I emphasize six-story because if it's a one-story, six-story, 40-story, it's just the same roof. And solar is proportional to the area, and as a consequence, it, it, it's ironic. The only net energy positive six-story building in the planet is in the cloudiest major city in the contiguous 48 <laughs> states. But it shows what can happen on the consumption side. We harvest rainwater, put it in a cistern in the basement, filter it, uh, both with mechanical filters and with ultraviolet, and then chlorinate it and use it not just to water our plants and flush our toilets, but as potable drinking water. All of the water in the building comes from rain. We have no connection to Seattle's water system. We have no connection to Seattle's sewage system. We process our stuff in compost bins in the basement come up with stuff that can be put out on, on plants afterwards. Uh, we take our treated gray water and introduce it into a bioswale right into a park next to the building. Uh, <laughs> one of the things you were talking about was your combined sewer overflow problems here. I mean, typically, again, in Seattle, water comes out on the roof of a building. It's on asphalt shingles. It slips over into uh, something that will shoosh it out through drain pipes goes out into the street where buses have gone by and cars and there's asphalt, picks up these complex hydrocarbons, sows them into the storm sewer system, flushes them out into Elliott Bay where it is toxic to marine life. Uh, lots of ways that you can invest a lot of money to try to process that. But what we're trying to do is to get 
a, a building code that says everybody has to put a cistern in the basement of their building. And whenever it rains, uh, the water goes down there and you can use it for whatever you want to in your building and that stops it from going out onto the streets and causing all of these problems. If you don't want to make the steps that we did, which frankly were administratively difficult and technically pretty easy to convert it to potable drinking water, at the very least, catch it when it's raining and then let it go from your cistern when it's not raining so you're not overloading your combined sewer overflow system. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and on and on. There is nothing in the building that is toxic, carcinogenic, mutagenic, in any way harmful, not only to any of its residents, but to the people that were building the building. And the final thing is uh, it's been fully tenanted from about two or three months from the time that we commissioned the building. It's been fully leased to commercial tenants. We've been in the black from the second year of operation. And the total cost of the building per square foot is roughly the same as the total cost of a standard office building without any of these features per square foot in Seattle, all of which is, I, I need to be forthcoming, uh, driven by one big phenomenon, which is the typical office building has a parking lot underneath it. We have a parking lot, but only for bicycles. Uh, and we have a repair facility and you can put your bike there. We're on a major bus route. We're really close to light rail. We're very close to a trolley system. You've got all kinds of Ubers and Lyfts and car to go. And uh, I, I, there, there was just no reason to have to have automobiles. I, I don't, final little clip on this because I'm, and I'm sure there has to be one or two others in this room, a, a bicycle fanatic. There is nothing in the biosphere that moves a creature around as efficiently as a human being on a bicycle. It's better than a dolphin. It's way better than a cheetah. I mean, there's, 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 it, it, it's comparable in terms of energy exerted per unit of distance traveled to a condor. Um, it's, 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 bicycles are fabulous, and we just wanted to promote them. But it <laughs> saved us a ton of money. <laughs> good, good endorsement. Okay. <clears throat> Hope. Hopefully some of you have questions on government and how they can be involved in public-private partnerships. Right now I'm Rick Jackson, senior host and producer for Ideastream. Today I'm talking with Dennis Hayes, the president and CEO of the Bullock Foundation, board chair emeritus of the Earth Day Network. We are about to begin our famous City Club audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everybody, City Club members, guests, students, those of you joining us via radio or live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club and our staff will try and work it into the program. Holding the microphones today, Marketing and Outreach Coordinator Julia Wong and Director of Programming Stephanie Jansky. May we have the first question, please, Stephanie. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Uh, I think you might have a unique perspective with respect to water. You live in the Northwest. You've got roots in the Great Lakes, and you're probably uh, pretty familiar with the issue of water in Southern California and in the West. Uh, so. I'm going to use that as an opportunity to ask you about your opinion about water in the future. Um, do you think that there's going to be a political effort or e any effort to uh, use water from the Great Lakes watershed to satisfy the drought and the water needs of the, of the Southwest? And then even more specifically, am I being paranoid in, uh, in, in, <laughs> in fearing that that's going to happen? Thanks. Wow, well, uh, always glad to start off with one of the easy ones. <laughs> uh, it, it, in the Northwest, our great fear is, of course, Southern California coming up with a massive strata siphon the Columbia River down to Southern California. There's a perception in some circles that if any drop of water in any river actually makes it all the way to the ocean, that's a failure of human ingenuity. <laughs> um, and, and, and with regard to my own intense uh, involvement with water. It's interesting. I became an environmentalist. I decided what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Uh, when I was about 19 years old, hitchhiking across the Namib Desert, and it has nothing to do with the fact that uh, too complicated a story to get into, but, but suffice it to say, I have never been more thirsty in my life than I was when <laughs> I, I made that choice. Um, I, I, th there are undoubtedly 20 people in this room who know more than I do about the, the likelihood of somebody seriously trying to take water out of the Great Lakes and pump it that vast distance. If I were, and, and I, I, I think that the politics of that, boy, um, I, 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 I think it would be extremely difficult to accomplish 
probably during my lifetime, and I'm probably pretty unwise, if I were trying to guess where I thought the biggest demand would be, uh, I, I, I think it's not going to be Arizona and New Mexico, where I, I think that a lot of that is going to be, I hate to say this, uh, but much like parts of the Middle East, almost written off, it cannot support its current population, and it's going to be solved through migration. If there were a place where I think there might be a genuine, maybe irresistible demand for Great Lakes water, it would be in the Midwest, in some of the grain producing former prairie regions, uh, much of which I think probably should be returned to grasslands, uh, but the powers against that will be formidable. Uh, as many of you know, I'm sure you've had programs on it here, the Ogallaga is, is going down. There are some places where the water table is sinking anywhere from six to 10 feet a year and that much more energy to pump that water a greater distance. And ultimately, of course, you hit the bottom. And um, that, that was the answer to the Dust Bowl. I mean, the fact that we found this amazing, gigantic aquifer, but it's fossil water and we've been pumping it out and that will come to an end. Is it up to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, the six states that border the water, the federal government to protect the lakes? Boy, I, I, when, when people come to the Pacific Northwest and opine on what we ought to be doing about orcas, uh, a, a lot of us who have been devoting our lives to that think, what the hell do you know about it? Which is, I think, what anybody can legitimately say with regard to my answer about Great Lakes protection. My, my limited involvement in this has always been just with, and, and it, it's decades old, with, with pollution control within it. I just, I'm not familiar enough with these issues. Question. Yes, Dennis, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for everything that you've done in your life. Commitment to the environment, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's inspiring to those of us who have also been active in Cleveland. And, um, you know, I just want to extend my gratitude for all that you've done. Um, <laughs> But could you, there's been talk about the triple bottom line, and I'd like you to explain, let others know if they don't, what that actually means. And could you connect that with the importance of a B corporation and being able to incorporate with your responsibility, not just to your investors and to making a profit, but to this triple bottom line? Thanks. Uh, sure. Uh, historically, if you take a course in Econ 101 and you're being exposed for the first time to the thinking of Adam Smith, you think of the invisible hand trying to maximize profits. And if you can maximize profits, perhaps by the time you get to 2011, maximize some combination of profits and growth, that that is your responsibility as a corporate CEO. You know, it's to your shareholders and to get them just as much money back on their investments as possible. What has been happening over time is that people have recognized that there are responsibilities not just to shareholders, but also to workers, to the surrounding community, to consumers, to society at large. And that became the double bottom line, that you had to be not just maximizing profits, but doing it within the constraints of being a responsible corporate citizen. And then as environmental issues bottled, and, and we began to see that, that much of what were seen as the profits of company came from the fact that they were externalizing their costs. They, they were things that they were producing that were toxic and that ought to be remedied, but they were just throwing them into the air or throwing them into the water. Um, and that that was unfair to society and, and that it was also producing fires on the Cuyahoga River. Uh, and so the triple bottom line then incorporates environmental values in with this as well. There is still something, particularly in different states, which have different kinds of approaches to corporate charters, that puts enormous pressure on companies in those states uh, to keep the uh, interests of shareholders first and foremost. The so-called B corporations uh, are, are a different type of corporate charter that is set up that explicitly allows you to, legally and without any fear of being sued by your shareholders, uh, not do that, but, but in fact to run it, your corporation as an instrument of social good. Here, I mean, there, there are, you still want to get bank loans. You still want to be able to run something that's making a profit so that you can continue to employ people and expand. Uh, but, but you're not focused exclusively on the maximizing of that, but rather upon uh, making this an instrument for social good. 
I'll, I'll say in terms of my personal view as somebody who's been involved in the corporate responsibility business now for 35 years, I, I was the founding co-chair of a group called Ceres, for those of you who follow this, this field. Uh, I, I think it's an incredibly important development. Um, it, there, there are other ways to do it, but, but it has been one that has picked up a, a, a whole lot of adherence and they've produced some wonderful new companies. And this basic approach to a triple bottom line, I think is, is the best defense that capitalism has against the pressures that are mounting against it. Uh, there, there is, uh, I'm going a little bit off message, but, but <laughs> let, let, let me just jump for a second. Go ahead. <laughs> um, Tom Piketty wrote a book a couple of years ago. It's uh, updating Karl Marx. It's Capital uh, for right now. It's the name of the book. Uh, and he, he went through detailed surveys in country after country of what has happened to the profits that are made by companies and um, how revenues are, are distributed. And the evidence was just overpowering. Uh, for, and, and you look at the United States, for about 40 years, essentially all of the fruits of growth has gone to shareholders and essentially none of it in real dollars adjusted for inflation has gone to workers. And that has created this increasingly big, we refer to it as a gap, but it's a canyon between the holders of, of capital and the providers of labor. And then using Credit Suisse numbers um, and some from Forbes magazine, uh, a, a study came out two years ago that had just this shattering conclusion that the eight richest men in the world possessed more wealth than the poorest 50% of the human population. I mean, that, that, that's a maldistribution that is in excess of what you saw under the pharaohs. I mean, it's just almost inconceivable. <laughs> and, and somehow we have to blend our way through all of this and and... It, it, it is not an adequate instrument for all of that, but moving toward a triple bottom line approach and the advent of B corporations is a hugely powerful step in the right direction. Let's put some pressure on the next question and see if we can use the word river in this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, close. Um, last summer here at the City Club um, at the State of the Great Lakes address, the scientist who is here who studies plastics in the Great Lakes talked about the need to... Um, stop the spigot uh, of, uh, you know, so we can try to get the plastics out of the water, but we need to stop putting them in, which means we need alternatives that are non-toxic, biodegradable. So my question is, have you, or could you please use your influence on some of the billionaires on the West Coast, perhaps a couple of them in Seattle? Um, one of them who could, one of them in particular who could actually profit, I suppose, more from creating products, alternative products for his companies such as Amazon and Whole Foods Market. Like he has built in um, a built-in marketplace for those alternatives if, if uh, he required everyone to use a safe, non-toxic, biodegradable alternative. Sure, I'll, I'll call Jeff as soon as I get home. <laughs> No, I, I don't mean to make light of it. Huge, important issue. It is an area where there's a lot of really interesting research going on about materials that have the characteristics you were talking about. And, and one of the ways that, that, that our economy functions really well is when there is a consumer demand for something, it tends to get produced. And the more demand there is, the more it's produced. Um, the reason that we have so many organic farmers in the United States today compared to 50 years ago is that it came out of Mothers worried about their kids. Um, and I, I, I think we're going to be able to get that with plastics as well. It's been getting just enough attention. One of, one of the things that's hugely important is, is images. And I, is there anybody in this room who doesn't know what I'm talking about when I say the turtle and the straw? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And, and so you, know, you go through the array of issues that are facing humanity and the planet today. Plastic straws probably doesn't make the top 1,000, but in place after place after place after place, plastic straws are, are being banned out of the power of that one incredible video. 
Uh, you, can't have, you can't get a plastic straw today in Seattle, any place. It's illegal. And I, I think in area after area, I think you get this demand building up and the change comes. That's what we do. We respond. Tell Jeff I said hi, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. You said we have to work internationally on this. Can you give me an example of something that you have learned from an international counterpart? Hmm. Wasn't the question that I was expecting from you, but, but, but <laughs> that, 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 that's good. Um, learned lots of things that work, not all of which are translatable to America. Um, when we were trying to figure out what we could do with the green building and we were considering oh, maybe lead gold or oh, maybe a stretch for lead platinum, to, to put this in context, we use about a third the amount of energy per square foot of a typical lead platinum building in Seattle. So we, we, we think through all this, we started looking at Europe to see what they had in Malmo, what they did in Copenhagen. What, uh, I spent some time in Berlin looking. We did get something there, uh, the concept of putting your Venetian blinds on the outside of the windows instead of the inside. Once the sunlight has come through the window, it's already warmed up the room in the summer. Uh, put the Venetian blinds on the outside and you're going to be able to keep the sun from coming in. And if you do it intelligently enough so you're tilting them, there are days when you're keeping the sunlight out. There are days when you want the light in but the heat not to come and you just tilt the blinds like that to reflect it further inside. I picked that up from people in Berlin where I wouldn't say it's commonplace, but there are certainly scores and scores of buildings that did it and none in the United States before we did it. Um, uh, something I learned, that absolutely, nothing. I, I was talking with the vice mayor of uh, Helsinki and he was talking about what he was doing with land use policy and what they were doing in transportation and how they integrated the two of those things. And, and there were issues that we were facing in Seattle that we'd just been batting our heads against the wall. And I said, how in the world did you get that to happen? And he said, well, we own all the land. <laughs> <laughs> you want to build? You can get a 99-year lease. But, but, but I, I, I don't think I can sell that to Jeff. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, there, I, I guess the learning from all of that is and this applies broadly to environmental things. There will be different solutions in different economies with different cultures and different politics and different problems, but we all have to come together around a, a set of values that are shared and recognize that we're gonna do our part uh, and everybody else needs to do theirs. Uh, tragically, right at the moment, much of the world is saying we're not doing our part and as a consequence, they don't need to do theirs. When you talked about meeting with the vice mayor, is there enough debate, enough cooperation between what happens in the public sector and the private sector? Is that something we need to knit better together to go forward as one unit? Yes. I mean, there, there are any number of places where public-private partnerships can, can work really well. And, uh, we, and we've explored them uh, with regard to various kinds of in industrial productivity. There are also a bunch of places that, that, that candidly, I, I, I think it's been wildly abused. I mean, I, I, this, this is not an anti-Amazon lunch, but, but, but Amazon is just a breathtakingly rich company. For it to be going around to dozens of cities across the United States and saying, what bribe will you give me to locate there? I mean, I, 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 I think that's just flat out outrageous. <laughs> He's happy we lost. <laughs> uh, it, it, I did not ever expect to become a real estate developer, and, and my value system has a relatively modest overlap with the real estate developer in the White House. But one thing that I've learned <laughs> since I, I've been in this is, is that what you try to get out of cities is as much as you can get. And, and so we're trying to figure out, okay, what kinds of incentives can we give people uh, that will cause them to make their buildings dramatically more efficient or will cause them to put these cisterns down in their basement. And no matter what you offer, it is never enough. And um, <coughs> I, I mean, it's never enough except for the handful of truly enlightened green entrepreneurs. There are, there are the exceptions, but, but that is not where that entire industry is. I know I've offended some developers in the room, but that's just been my experience. So uh, I'm coming out now of, of 
uh, a dozen years of pushing aggressively on a wide variety of things where you say, get two more stories of height here, or you can go to this where you're at the head of the queue for that regulatory process, or uh, we get a transferable development right. No matter what the incentives were, we couldn't get the changes we were looking for. And I, I, I think I've now basically come to the point that the most important instruments are to decide as a city, as a polity, what your vision for your future is, and then lay that out as codes and standards. You want to build a building here, you got to meet these standards as opposed to incentives. So let's grab another question. I also want to thank you for all you've done to help change the course of history in a positive way. My question relates to your comment about the Earth Day is now at the uh, on election day. I know in the le in the last election, Washington State had a ballot measure on climate, and I believe Arizona had a clean energy climate uh, measure as well, and both of them went down to defeat. I'm curious as to your um, comment on why that happened and what we can do to to change that in the future. Okay, uh, <laughs> a little embarrassing. Um, to have maybe the sunniest state in the United States once again decline to move aggressively into solar energy. For some reason, Arizona uh, has, has just been hostile. Uh, and, and it has mostly been a result of their utility, but also a result of their utility commission, which is, always has one or two good commissioners, but never enough to get a, uh, a renewable portfolio standard that will push them aggressively enough in the right direction. Interestingly, the same thing was true in Hawaii until about five years ago. And Hawaii flipped, had new political leadership, the new Public Utility Commission. Then they had an attempt at hostile takeover by an out-of-state utility. And the utility in Hawaii realized it didn't have the public support that it needed. And Hawaii has just done this complete flip. Hawaii is likely to be uh, entirely renewable, I would guess, no later than 2040. And it could be dramatically faster than that. Uh, it has now the two largest solar slash battery utility things where it provides 24 hour a day uh, uh, electricity for less than half the cost of what they were paying for their oil generated electricity. That was the principal way they generated power in Hawaii. Uh, it made economic sense 20 years ago. It made economic sense 10 years ago. It made economic sense five years ago and they're doing it in 20, well, 2018 because they were forced to. But now they're getting enthusiastic about it. And they've got this new generation of leadership that's moving into the utility industry. So Arizona, the utility fought it successfully. Uh, for what it's worth, the uh, prominent environmental billionaire, uh, former hedge fund manager, Tom Steyer, threw a ton of money into that. And it, it just couldn't pull it off. Washington State. Um, OK, this was a really modest thing. This, this would have been a $15 uh, a ton uh, fee on carbon emissions. It, 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 I was embarrassed that it was so small, uh, and, and yet it got defeated. Uh, I, there, there are a variety of reasons, but by far the most important was that the petroleum industry was afraid that if it passed there, that it would begin something that was sweeping state after state after state. So they resolved to spend as much as it took to defeat it. Um, and for those of you who are trying to decide where you're going to buy your gasoline, I will say that for my purposes, I will never buy a gallon of gasoline from British Petroleum again. They ran a truly despicable, dishonest, vastly expensive campaign. So the oil industry in Washington State spent a little over $33 million defeating this citizen's initiative. Uh, Washington is not New York or California. 33 million bucks is more money than was spent by the Democratic successful candidate for the U.S. Senate, by her Republican opponent, and by all PACs and interest groups on both sides of a Senate race. And they put that amount of money just into defeating this initiative. And it was a campaign that filled the airwaves with lies and distortions, and, uh, and they prevailed. Um, I, I think we are going to win with something in the legislature because at the same time that that went down, there were significant changes in the political makeup of the Washington State Legislature. And so we're, we're going to be taking another attack at that next year. And we have a governor, Jay Inslee, who, who campaigned on climate and won on climate twice. And it, it, it's a bit of an embarrassment to him that 
that his state went down that way. He campaigned aggressively for it. But, uh, there, there, there is difficulty to get people to tax themselves. It just, it, it's, it's Proposition 13 destroyed the state of California. It's just outrageous. It, it, the educational system, the wonderful public university system, it, it, it all just crumbled because people were afraid of increasing property taxes. Uh, and to voluntarily do that with a carbon tax is just something that they managed to, to defeat. I'm embarrassed by that. It's one of the reasons why when I'm talking about my optimism, it's not unrestrained optimism. <laughs> we still have to somehow make this stuff congruent with the aspirations of, of people. It has to work. Last thing, I have to ask you to keep the question, the answer down to about 90 seconds. Okay. How do we take this 50th anniversary of what happened down the street and use it as a launching point to better ourselves? Well, uh, the reason that I'm here in 90 seconds is that, that part of Earth Spring is going to be stuff that we're going to be handling nationally and internationally with advertising campaigns and social media campaigns and things with museums and zoos and aquariums around the uh, institutional things where we get folks to jump. But the power of it is all going to be lying in communities. It's going to be lying with the people in this room deciding how you can take advantage of this for your purposes. There is going to be a climate, I hope, if we're successful, created in which you can actually move the environmental ball down the field quite some distance. You have to figure out which balls you want to carry and how far you can get it down the field. And what's the best way to do that in Cleveland and who you need to enlist and who your friends are going to be, who your enemies are going to be, how you play the chess game, and then get it done. But uh, we can do anything that we want to with these national advertising campaigns. If it's not the Clevelands of the world getting themselves together mobilizing around their allies and achieving some progress, then, then this is not going to be worth doing. We've been listening to Dennis Hayes, President and CEO of the Bullet Foundation, Board Chair Emeritus of the Earth Day Network. Help me in thanking him. <laughs> Y'all are... You're good, but I got more to read here, if that's okay. <laughs> Today's forum is part of our Igniting the Future series, sponsored by the Cleveland Foundation and the George Gund Foundation. Also part of our Sustainable Northeast Ohio series, sponsored by Bank of America and the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, with additional support from Great Lakes Brewing Company. We are delighted to have representatives from all of our sponsors here today. Thank you for your continued support of City Club programming. Community partners for today's forum include the Cleveland Water Alliance, Cuyahoga Valley National Park, and Sustainable Cleveland. Our hospitality partner is the Metropolitan the Nine Hotel. Thank you all for your partnership. Lastly, we welcome guests at a table hosted by Cuyahoga River Restoration and students from Flow Homeschool Co-op. Support for student participation in City Club forums comes from Key Bank and the William M. Weiss Foundation with additional support from the donors you find listed in today's program. We thank you all for being here today. That brings us to the end of the forum. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.